I like to give a land acknowledgement before we start um, that we are meeting uh, on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the uh, Anish Nabek and the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse uh, First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered under Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. And since this is a virtual meeting, many others may be on different territories. So please take your time to reflect and honor the indigenous communities um, you know, of your territories. So next slide, please. Um, for those of you who are joining and don't know much about OICR, we're a cancer research institute funded by the Ontario government. We've been around for over 15 years, 300 uh, people staff strong, mostly scientists located in the Mars Discovery District in Toronto. And as shown here by our branding um, sort of tagline, Collaborate, Translate, Change Live, we do collaborative um, research uh, through not only in-house research and collaboration, but also our funding programs to really translate cancer discoveries uh, to patients and, and for the benefit of the health system, the Ontario economy. Next slide. Um, you want to go to the next slide? Yeah. So the Rising Stars program is a sort of an idea that we had a number of years, uh, about three years ago, when I first came to OICR in 2018, to sort of really bring together trainees, both postdocs, graduate students, and advanced um, undergraduate students who are very interested in cancer research and performing cancer research across Ontario, and bring them together in sort of a unified network to empower them and to really make them visible as a group, um, as they are basically the future. They are the next generation of cancer researchers and we need to foster them. So um, it, it's, it's, it's really um, a network that facilitates events, workshops, seminars, and awards to highlight trainee research and provide opportunities to, train, to trainees to collaborate, boost their skills and strengthen their network. And it's really taken off if you haven't, you know, you know, really been involved with the uh, Rising Stars Network and you are a trainee at the postdoctoral level and graduate student level, please, you know, contact um, OICR. You can go to our website. There's a link on our main page to the trainee network to Rising Stars. You can go directly then to the website of the Rising Stars and then they'll have a lot of information on what Rising Stars is about, its purpose, um, what are some of the activities um, that, that it's doing and also some contact people that you can uh, talk to and, and, and uh, you know, to get involved. And we welcome you trainees to get involved um, to really strengthen this network because it's, it's really, um, I hear a lot of positive stories and remarks from people across the province um, ab um, ab about it. So um, I'd like to give it over. To, I'd like to introduce, of course, the panelists right now. Um, and Elisa Vito. Elisa is a really uh, bright young scientist um, here in Ontario. Uh, she did her PhD at McMaster University with Karen Mossman, and she studies B cells in immunotherapy, which is an exciting sort of old but new area uh, that uh, people are working on now. People are realizing that in addition to T cells, I think B cells are important too as well. They're sort of the other side of the immune system, the adaptive immune system. And so there's been really some exciting data now on the role of B cells and the fact that you need B cells for um, efficient adaptive immune responses, even to current immunotherapeutics. And so um, she's, she's, she's working in that area and she's be, she'll be moderating uh, this panel discussion. And so uh, Elisa, please take it away. And um, I'm, I'm excited to listen to all the insights. Um, so Thanks, Laszlo. Laszlo. So we're actually going to pass it over to Robert um, first. So um, each of the speakers are going to give us their own kind of personal perspective on their career, uh, about 10 minutes each. So I will actually pass it on over to Robert and we'll have him give us uh, his perspective first. Okay, yeah, no, I'm happy to give you a little bit of a summary of, of, of sort of where I came from. I'm obviously uh, British, uh, grew up in the UK. Uh, and originally did a microbiology disease um, degree at the University of uh, East Anglia. Uh, but then I moved to do a PhD uh, in London uh, at Imperial College, uh, which was on virology, which is what I've been doing ever since, but on plant virology. Uh, and uh, there trying to understand diseases which were uh, causing problems in, in greenhouse plants. But I always had uh, an interest in really trying to apply basic science rather than just do basic science for the sake of doing it and finding things out in a sort of stamp collecting fashion, uh, always uh, with the intention of how we can really use it uh, to create things which are really going to change 
society uh, or become uh, actual uh, products. Uh, so from, from and there was really was a lot of interest in in plant genetic engineering and related things uh, at that time. Uh, and stemming from that PhD, my original plan actually was to work on making um, vaccines for infectious diseases uh, in plants, uh, particularly actually HIV vaccines, which was very uh, relevant at, at that time uh, to try and make a, a quasi species vaccine against HIV using tobacco mosaic virus as a means of expressing uh, a whole quasi species of, uh, of antigen on the surface. Uh, of, of of that virus. In the end, that didn't pan out, and I ended up not going to the Salk Institute to do that, which was the plan, uh, but instead went to uh, University College London uh, to work on herpes simplex virus. Uh, and really, uh, I've been working on herpes simplex virus uh, ever since. So that had a, a dual purpose. It had the, uh, an initial purpose or a, a first purpose uh, of trying to understand how herpes virus latency worked at the molecular level. Uh, which was more of an academically interesting purpose, uh, although would, if uh, understood, uh, potentially provide new avenues to try and treat uh, chronic uh, herpes uh, infection, uh, but also had the purpose of trying to develop uh, gene therapies uh, based on herpes simplex virus uh, as a means to introduce genes uh, into the nervous system. Uh, and one of my key grants I was funded on uh, did in, was indeed in aiming to do that, uh, and in particular try and develop gene therapies for uh, Parkinson's disease. Herpes simplex virus does go latent in the nervous system uh, and therefore has the potential to provide very long-term gene expression uh, in the nervous system, which could be therapeutically beneficial. So that was in the early-ish 1990s, where I grew a group of probably uh, 20 to 30 uh, PhD and postdocs, uh, funded both from government grants, charity grants, and from industry. We had quite a large um, funding from GSK, in fact, to study um, herpes virus uh, latency. And over those years, led to a body of knowledge, publications, and in fact, patents uh, to which we felt took the field of gene therapy with herpes simplex virus vectors um, forward, in particular how you made them non-toxic uh, and how you also uh, enabled them to uh, provide long-term expression uh, in the nervous system, uh, bearing in mind that the herpes genome is shut down during latency as uh, tended to be any gene you inserted uh, into it. So we felt that we had um, cracked some of the key uh, issues with making herpes vectors uh, actually uh, ready for prime time, uh, had done lots of uh, preclinical work, uh, including in, in rodent models, uh, built a, an infrastructure of people and lab. Uh, we'd managed to get um, funding for contained animal facilities. Uh, at that time, uh, there was uh, entirely reasonable concern that, the, that gene vectors may be uh, not things you want to escape into the environment. So we actually built a BSL-3 lab funded by the uh, MRC, uh, generated, as I said, proof of concept data in animals, in various models, including for Parkinson's disease, uh, chronic um, pain and, and uh, some other areas, uh, and initiated, uh, generated initial IP. However, uh, from the perspective of an ac academic, uh, one then uh, came to somewhat of a dead end if one really wanted to take your things forward uh, to really test uh, in, in humans. There was very much a lack of a clear path uh, to beginning the activities necessary to go from uh, lab uh, to uh, patient, in particular, a lack of ability to uh, get uh, GXP, uh, i.e. toxicology and manufacturing uh, activities funding, funded, uh, a lack of clear um, way of getting sufficient funding to get into phase one trials. Uh, and even if one was able to get academic funding uh, to achieve those steps, uh, it was unclear what one would be able to do next to move into phase two and later stage development, which is obviously uh, much bigger and more uh, effective. So the thought was among, amongst myself uh, and my colleague uh, that grant, grant funding was, if we were able to get it to get on with those things, very much like to be sort of drip fed, uh, inadequate, inflexible and take a very, very long time to do, which all in all uh, led to our um, decision that we would try and uh, spin uh, our um, data and nascent IP out into uh, a company. 
And for me, that also came to the came from the perspective that as a non MD, uh, the career path uh, in UK academia uh, wasn't clear. Uh, and I found the uh, idea of moving more into biotech uh, as being uh, uh, attractive uh, for me, even though I had an established academic career at University College London. Um, so to achieve that, obviously, there are a number of things which need to really come together uh, to make it happen. And the first thing in London at University College London was that the, that the university had a very active technology transfer office, uh, which was very helpful uh, and supportive in the initial stages uh, with a long, a strong recent history of spin outs uh, being successfully accomplished. Uh, the tech transfer office supported all the initial uh, patent filings uh, and paid for those uh, and also introduced us to professional support such as lawyers, uh, mentors, uh, etc, uh, who were able to help with initial business plans and make some initial introductions to um, VCs, venture capital funders uh, as well. UCL also allowed uh, founders to retain significant equity uh, in the companies which span out and uh, to retain an academic position part-time uh, even once the company had span out. So that actually always for me provided a, a sort of insurance policy that I could actually go back to my academic position uh, if, I, if I wished. So we did manage to um, found a company uh, legally, um, which initially transferred the ownership of the patents uh, into the company in return for equity. Uh, and uh, after a number of years of trying, which certainly did take some time, multiple iterations of business plan, um, we, we, we received the initial funding in, in 1999, uh, which enabled us to build labs uh, at UCL uh, and hire um, a CEO uh, and other initial uh, management uh, and other uh, and obviously scientists, many of whom came out of my lab. So those were the early days of, of uh, what was then called actually NeuroVex. Our purpose was to try and treat neurological diseases and therefore we called ourselves NeuroVex. Uh, uh, but that was uh, very much the uh, beginning of the story. Um, BioVex, which it then beca which it beca became uh, when we um, moved to developing largely oncolytic uh, therapies, uh, took probably much longer than any of us probably expected to get from startup uh, to um, ultimate outcome. And in fact, it took from 1999 uh, to 2011 uh, with many, many uh, ups and downs uh, on that journey uh, by at which point the company uh, was uh, purchased by uh, Amgen uh, and then Amgen took the lead product forward, uh, which was in the middle of phase three to uh, ultimate uh, approval in melanoma. So in hindsight, actually getting the company going and spin it out of the out of the university was sort of the easy bit um, due to the uh, challenging funding environment, uh, the lack of um, fashionability of many of the things we were doing, which were a combination of gene therapy, cancer vaccines, cancer immuno immunotherapy and oncolytic viruses, all of which were really rather un unfashionable uh, areas of endeavor uh, at that time meant it was a continual challenge uh, to uh, achieve keeping the company funded. And we certainly went through many mere, uh, numerous uh, near death experiences as we did, uh, where which we weren't clear we were gonna be able to keep the doors open the next day. So um, one does certainly need quite a lot of characteristics to get uh, through all the way uh, from the beginning to the end, which may well be a lot longer than one might have, ho have, ho have hoped. <clears throat> so in particular, uh, you certainly need um, stamina uh, to, um, to, to if you're, one's going to embark on a, on a spin-out type career. You also do need to be prepared to fully leave your academic role behind. Well, I did have the backup. I did move full-time into the company and fully commit. Investors do not like um, um, founders uh, who uh, are only sort of partially uh, in the company and not fully committed uh, and uh, sharing the risk with them. I also think you do need to be uh, very stubborn in reality, while you definitely need to listen to advice uh, from uh, people who may be more experienced than yourself. You also need to take it with a pinch of salt, uh, and you often really do need to stick to your guns uh, in, in spite of uh, advice which may be coming uh, from others. Um, I think you need to be extremely versatile. Uh, you need to be able to change in light of data 
uh, both one's own data and from the external world. You need to be uh, very good at communicating a very clear vision uh, and keeping that message clear. Uh, and you need to be able to really stay on the cl critical path and not get sidetracked down things which may be academically interesting, but are not really going to take your programs uh, to the next stage. You need to be reliable. You need to really deliver on what you're going to say uh, you're going to do to investors. You need, you, you, they, you need to have a history of showing that when you say you're going to do something, you they actually do do it. Uh, and then they're going to be uh, happy to hopefully fund you to the next stage after that. Um, you, you, the team is unbelievably important. You have to have a very strong team. It is not only you. Uh, you need a close-knit team who really are, are able to uh, work together, uh, and, but also be very open to uh, new and external ideas coming in from new people who join the company as the company grows. You absolutely need to be prepared to do whatever's needed to get it done, uh, which can uh, take a significant toll on one's uh, personal life in reality. Uh, in fact, for many years, one doesn't uh, necessarily have time for a personal life, which is quite possibly why I ended up not having children until I was uh, 47. Um, so, so one needs to um, be um, ready for what, what, what to be prepared for what's going to be necessary to ultimately get through to the uh, ultimate outcome, which is hopefully uh, products which will actually treat and benefit patients, uh, which will, uh, which may uh, mean uh, various approaches to continued funding, which may be a sale of a company, maybe an IPO or whatever. But the ultimate objective really is to deliver new technologies and products to to benefit patients. So, so that's a sort of an overview of, of me and where I came from and the things I think one needs to um, move out of academia and have a successful ultimate spin out uh, experience. That's so great, Robert. Thank you so much for sharing. It's nice to hear in your own words, kind of the maybe untraditional trajectory your career has had. Um, so we'll save all of the questions for uh, the panel discussion at the end. So uh, we're going to pass it on now to Carolina. And Carolina, you can um, go ahead and give us your personal perspective as well. Hi, everyone. Can you? I have one slide, not many, but. Um, I'm really happy to be here. I, I really believe that in investing in, in trainees and and uh, and interacting with, with you guys is I, is part of the job that I love. Um, I'm really committed to training and and uh, and always thinking in ideas how to boost the exposure of my train even my trainees to to new opportunities. So. As you probably can tell, I have a very strong Spanish accent. So um, I'm originally from Argentina. I, I did my undergraduate degree there in, in Buenos Aires. And I had been always passionate about science. I, I When I was still in Argentina, I did a lot of research. It, a totally different way of doing research though, and, and I will go into that, but like, I work in the Amazonian forest. I, I did a lot of outreach res research in, in Aboriginal communities and, and different diseases that, that impact those communities, including parasites and, and different infections that are very communi uh, common in, in tropical areas and, and in indigenous communities. So that was very fascinated work. I learned a lot. Um, I struggled a lot through through that type of research, but really, I think changed who I am and how I see the world. But but I always wanted to do science, and I really wanted to do high quality science. And 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 as Dr. Coffin just said, I one day I want to change cancer patients' lives. So I knew that. Um, even though when my family was in Argentina and is still in Argentina, I, what I do today, I will not be able to do it there. So I had to make a decision of exploring other areas and, and, and leaving my country and, and I decided to, to come to Canada. Um, so when I, um, oops, uh, so the, my first step in Canada was indeed Edmonton. <laughs> 
So imagine I went from the Amazonian tropical forest to um, cold Edmonton. Um, I arrived, I remember it at the end of August and it was extremely cold and it started snowing and never stopped. Um, so why I did that is I, I always was passionate about viruses and, and I had, after sending thousands, and I'm not lying, thousands of emails contacting different people, seeing if they were going to give me an opportunity. Um, only one person answered, and, and that was who was my PhD supervisor, Dr. Tom Holman. Um, so that was my first lesson, and it was um, perseverance. And, and I think at the time I knew what I wanted, and I was to again explore new opportunities and, and try to do science at a different level that was not possible in my country. So it was months and months of sending emails and not getting answers. And uh, um, also months of training, right? Like I, I did not speak English, so I had to learn English and, and not only learn English, but also pass exams like the TOEFL and the GRE to enter to a Canadian university. So that was in addition to going to, to university, I was studying English and, and preparing for all those exams. So again, I think perseverance was the first thing that I learned that you need to keep trying. And if you are convinced that that is your career path and your passion, eh, you need to keep trying because sometimes it's, the first shot will not give you what you want, but there are opportunities out there. You just need to explore them. Um, but anyhow, I arrived to Canada and I did my PhD studying virus host cell interactions. My, the topic of my, my work was mostly on pathogenic viruses. It, this is a, a, a lab that works on flabby viruses and other viruses that are pathogenic, like West Nile, dengue, Zika, so all the bad guys, as I like to call them. And, and the, the study was mostly about how those viruses interact with the host. And I learned a lot, and I learned a lot about virology um, and, and also the cellular aspect of what it means to be infected. But of course, that was not my end goal. I knew that this was a stepping stone towards where I wanted to go, which was cancer research and cancer therapeutics. Um, but, but I think um, I, all the knowledge that I gained from a totally different field indeed had propelled my career in, in that aspect. And, and I was lucky enough to, to uh, reach out to, to John Bell when I decided to do a postdoctoral fellowship and, and he took me in his lab. And, and that was ideal for me because that is exactly what I wanted. I wanted a, a new challenge. So I decided to change fields from my PhD to my postdoctoral fellow, but also use some of that knowledge to, to build my postdoctoral studies. And I studied mostly with, with John and the interactions of oncolytic viruses and the tumor microenvironment. So again, that virus host cell interaction with the difference that now we were studying therapeutic viruses and the host was the tumor instead of normal cells. But I think um, it was very challenging again. So I had no work in cancer before. So it was a new area. And, and again, I'm grateful for that because that took me out of my comfort zone and really pushed me to, I think, the next level. Um, I, I, I have to say, I, one the other key message that I want to give you is, is not only about be perseverance, but also having selecting your mentors properly. So I have been extremely lucky with the mentors that I have in my, in my career journey. So um, first, Tom, believe in me and give me an opportunity uh, when others have not, and, and I'm grateful for that. But also he really uh, taught me key things about science, which was being very rigorous, being persistent, and, and also um, adversity, overcoming adversity, right? Like your PhD degrees sometimes is very challenging and, and you need a supervisor that is by your side. 
Um, but also he told me that there was so many options for me out there that I shouldn't stay with what I what was my comfort zone. And, and that is why I went to, to John's lab. And I think with John, um, I learned the, all the other aspects that I'm very grateful to, which is how to go beyond the science. When I have that solid foundation of how to do science, how to take it to the next level, how to start thinking about translated things and how to not only um, work by myself, but John told me how to collaborate. And I, and I think that is the other message that I want to tell you that doesn't matter in which area, uh, or if you are in the business area or in the academic area, I think collaboration and working well with your peers is extremely important. Science and, and making a change in, in, in people's life or in cancer patients cannot be done by a single person. So we need to be working together. And, and, and I think that is the other key message. And, and then I have my last step is what was next, right? And, and when I finished with John and, and I was lucky to, to have good publications, um, I, have to, I have options. So um, I was lucky enough to have a, a position available at McGill. Um, at the same time, my position here in Ottawa um, but also some opportunities in Boston to, to work for a startup company. And, and at the time, I wasn't sure what to do. So I think I took what I felt was right for me at the moment. My gear was very appealing, but I really want to do translational research. And, and uh, that is why I decided to stay here in, in Ottawa because I think the vision of the science and the translational research that I want to do is here. And, and in terms of why I didn't go to Boston and, and work for a startup company is because that is hopefully what I want to do next. Um, I would like to, to build therapeutics in, in Canada. I'm, I'm very grateful to Canada and I would like to establish something that um, maybe a startup company or, or technologies that will stay in Canada, ideally in Ontario, and, and foster a, this type of environment um, that I think is, is coming to, to Canada and, and be part of that. Um, I'm learning a lot, and I will, con I will encourage you to not only learn about your science, but other things, as Dr. Coffin I recently I had to learn about how to write an, a patent or, or how to be involved in preparing patents um, and start thinking about if we want to tra translate our technologies, how to, to engage with other parties that are not scientists and how to, to explain your research also in a way that is appealing to others but people can understand. So uh, as Dr. Confin says, build your, build your uh, be perseverance, build your communication skills, build your team, uh, but also be passionate and happy about what you are doing. If, if you are not doing what you are passionate about it, it's harder. And, and this is a hard, hard journey. So um, do what you love and, and be aware that sometimes people will not like what you are doing or will not reach out to you or will not engage you in, in, in their projects. But, but be perseverance and, and surround yourself with the right mentors and the right people because it makes a huge difference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carolina. It's such an interesting geographical journey as well as part of your story. So it's really nice to hear that. Um, so now I'm gonna pass it over to Sam for your personal perspective as well. Uh, thank you, everyone. I'm Sam Worknahi, assistant professor in uh, the University of Guelph, Department of Pathobiology. I have a slide which I would probably uh, upload to. I think you should be able to just share your screen. Okay. Yeah, I do that and it's not. Anyway, I can maybe... share it for you, Sam, if you like. Please, thank you. Sure.
Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. So I, I was born and I grew up uh, in Ethiopia, which is uh, located in the eastern part of Africa. I studied veterinary, veterinary medicine uh, uh, for the first six years of my university degree. And I wasn't sure, you know, if I should go into practice or, uh, you know, study more research and go towards uh, uh, any, any of this academic uh, route. So I was, I was very undecided early on and uh, I applied for an international uh, graduate master's degree uh, program where the program has like attendees from like all over the world, almost 20 countries. And that was really good um, because I, I was able to interact with lots of people from uh, different continents. And the place was also in a very cold, uh, almost Arctic circle, near the Arctic circle. And like uh, there was so much of, um, you know, change from uh, where I grew up uh, in terms of weather and climate. Uh, it gets dark at night during, uh, 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 in the daytime during uh, winter time. And uh, we can see uh, the lights, but lots of fun like to interact with uh, different types of uh, people from uh, many parts of the world. And, and then when I completed my uh, fishery study, which is mostly on uh, immunology, I, I got in contact with a, a virologist in uh, Prince Edward Island, uh, which is the eastern part of uh, Canada. Uh, also, uh, slightly different from you know my origin, lots of snow uh, and lots of uh, exposure to uh, really nice uh, oceanic uh, view. The the environment there was like sparsely populated. Uh, although like there was a lot of interaction with uh, other uh, people who have been studying uh, in that university from all over the place. And then uh, when I completed my uh, virology training there, I moved into McMaster University. And I think that's when, when I started the cancer research and really uh, I came to understand, you know, cancer is really, a very important uh, problem to to dedicate most of my career, and uh, I had also a, a great mentor, which I shared with uh, Alice. I was a PhD student. I was a postdoctoral fellow uh, under the supervision of Dr. Kara Mosman. Really, really good uh, mentor. Uh, she provided us all the resources we you know, we can get to uh, ask the right questions and experiment and uh, also tra trained us how to be good scientists. So th that, that's where I developed, I think a lot of my, my, re my research uh, capacity. And also I still do a similar type of research, but just more uh, going in depth towards uh, understanding what types of cell days and what processes are really important for uh, final outcomes of uh, immunotherapy. And we, we do a lot of work with tumors that are resistant to uh, immunotherapies, clinical immunotherapies like glioblastoma, pancreatic cancer. We have oncolytic virus and also other uh, inducers of immunogenic cell disease. And this is an area like I really want uh, to, uh, to do well for a while. And like I have now around seven students uh, who are working on different uh, aspects of this uh, research. My advice, uh, like for my career, next slide, please. Yeah, so if I reflect on my career uh, or as a trainee, it, it, it had some interesting uh, routes where I was excited to be a, a grad student uh, in Norway. PhD was a bit difficult because there, there was a shorter time period. And as an international student, you have to accomplish enough uh, to, to, to finish within the budget you are provided with, like which is three, four years. Uh, so, so it was a bit difficult, but 
the postdoc was the best time uh, for me to actually uh, handle difficult questions. Like it, it gave me a, a chance, one, to transition into the cancer field, which I, I found so much uh, enjoyable. Uh, and also the other thing is like, I, I was a virologist, so I could easily engineer virus for uh, cancer therapy. It, then the combination of this was, was uh, uh, foundational to the current state of my, my research. I, the, the challenge uh, I had, or you know, obstacles I have faced are more related towards you know, securing uh, academic uh, jobs, like not to be uh, pessimistic, but the reality is that uh, there is only few academic jobs that get posted uh, every year within Canada, especially if you have family ties to Canada that you, you can't move anywhere in the world. Then, then like with those, uh, they become uh, competitive because we have much more trainees than the, uh, the academic uh, jobs we would like to fill. Fill in, so it, it, it makes you to uh, to question if if it's the right type of uh, career. So I, I had a long a longer postdoc. So having a good mentor was really sub, uh, like supportive uh, to go through that uh, difficult routes. And Karen had been really supportive with like providing me like more resources to. To, to mentor other students, to interact outside of the lab, to travel, to meet uh, new people. So th those were really like some of the, the, the obstacles I, I met. Uh, but if, if I have to uh, give advice in the next slide uh, to uh, graduate students or postdoctoral fellows, I think for graduate students, it's really important. If, if you are interested to go to an academic career, which, which is a recipe I, I can tell, uh, it's really important to find a mentor that can take uh, a lot of uh, burden in a way that a, a mentor that's, that's available to help you uh, uh, improve your skills, to help you uh, achieve your, your career goals. And this, this is like not only like for a PhD supervisor, but also a career coach. So you kind of have like one uh, from your direct supervisor of your research, but also in your department or center or outside, like you can also have like uh, another uh, uh, mentor who can really tell you about job markets, about, you know, things that are realistic that your supervisor uh, may not uh, have informed you or doesn't have the, the, the experience to tell you. And, and because PhD, at the time of grad school, you don't know which career paths to follow. Uh, it's really important to master your discipline, read a lot, uh, learn from your lab people, center, the department, and also read voraciously uh, publications. And th those are really important because they, they, they let you know what's out there. And then you can, you know, like later on, you can specifically go to a direction that you are you are interested at, and also the other advice is it's really important also early in your career to apply for scholarships and awards because the more awards you have the more likely you're gonna get the next award so it's it's really important to start applying for uh, awards and scholarships even when it's difficult uh, when you know it's, it's difficult to get it it may be a good idea to start applying and see the feedback and improve on the feedback you receive to go uh, after like uh, fellowships and awards. The, the last uh, recommendation for early graduate students is to also network, travel to conference, network with people, uh, disseminate your, uh, your findings. And also that's how you actually uh, interact with uh, uh, postdoc supervisors or people who are really like late in their uh, career, like who have advanced to a greater stage. And th th that makes you to choose also which people can get along with you better, can, can understand your, your uh, uh, training uh, motives and all of that. For postdocs, it's, it's a, sl a slightly uh, different recipe I, I would recommend like it, it's really important uh, because a job 
we do is, is uh, like the academic job is very, very uh, intense and like demanding. It's really important to know and to identify what type of research you, you want to do uh, before you actually do a postdoc on, because if the question is really important, it, it, it becomes interesting, it, it, it has many rewards, like the, the findings could be relevant uh, to a patient, to the scientific community. There are so many ways you can see it, but it, 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 I think in my opinion, it's really important to identify an area of research where you can at least like do five, six years of uh, uh, research. And the, the second, uh, the points two to four are more into, the, if you are interested as a postdoc to go into uh, academic job, it may be a good idea to literally start taking duties that your supervisor is, is doing a lot more. So for example, you can mentor uh, junior students in the laboratory, you can uh, assist in grant writing, and then you also get returned that you can get recognized for uh, authorship when the junior scientists publish, or you can also get uh, co-applicantship in, in, in grants that you submit with the uh, supervisor. And really like the unfortunate, but also really important part of this, this academic route is really to publish uh, and publish and publish good science. Uh, that really is like where uh, people emphasize uh, mostly on, on like your CV. And it, at some point you can also uh, try to identify some uh, research you can take. Uh, you, you can discuss this with, with your uh, supervisor. Most mentors, good mentors are happy to provide a couple of research areas where you can, you can take it as your own research. Uh, and if you are interviewing, please, please uh, practice uh, the questions that possibly can be asked. There is a lot of online tool where you can, you can get like questions, academic questions like that people ask uh, for uh, on-campus uh, interviews. It's really good to practice those. Uh, also practice uh, actual talk, research talk. Some, some departments have also uh, talks they would uh, ask you to give like teaching, teaching lectures. Uh, I, I did both when I interviewed like both uh, uh, teaching in, uh, in a, the veterinary curriculum and also uh, uh, the the, the uh, research uh, question chalk talk is also important. Like there is a chalk talk uh, where you have to uh, identify your independent research. And the, honestly, uh, during interviews, the most important thing is, is is to reveal yourself that you are the best candidate uh, and a good uh, potential colleague because this uh, interaction stays for thirty years. Uh, so that that's all. Uh, I have, and thank you so much. I think I'm running out of time. That's great. Thank you so much, Sam. Thanks for sharing. Uh, thank you to all of the speakers. So we're gonna jump in, we're a little bit behind. We'll jump into the panel discussion now. So if anybody in the audience has um, a question they wanna ask, you can either raise your hand using the little reactions button at the bottom or um, type it in the chat. So if you wanna be able to actually ask the question yourself, just raise your hand and we can call on you and have you unmuted to ask yourself. Um, otherwise you can type it in the chat. Um, but I think until we have some questions come in, maybe I will just kick things off. So um, I think, you know, Robert, one of the things that you said was that, um, you know, making the initial IP in the lab seemed almost like a dead end in academia and that, you know, in traditional academic settings, there's really that like lack of a clear path of how to move things into a phase one trial and then phase two and later stages of translation. So maybe if you could just speak a little bit to how when people are, you know, designing experiments and projects in graduate school or even as a postdoc, how can you ensure that your work has a pipeline to actually get you to that initial IP and then to have support to move it further ahead as well? I think that's um, quite a, a difficult question. <laughs> <In fact. laughs> um, I mean, I think it's uh, very important for, for to not be doing stuff 
with the objective of trying to generate uh, IP, what one should be doing is trying to push the boundaries of knowledge uh, back uh, in, in, a, in a useful way uh, and make new discoveries which are going to be, one hopes, useful to mankind. Uh, and to make them actually useful to mankind, uh, in general, they have to become uh, products. Uh, and to become viable products, they need to have the IP protected such that one has the space uh, within which to develop them uh, without uh, competition coming along and copying you and, um, uh, and taking a shortcut uh, on, on the back of uh, one's hard work. But I think the answer to the question is one wouldn't, shouldn't necessarily be doing things from the objective of filing patents or, or creating IP, but doing things for pure scientific reasons, but targeted uh, at problems which hopefully can be translatable into real world solutions for whatever area of science one's working in. Uh, but one does need to then be cognizant that when one has um, hopefully made some uh, relevant discoveries that one does uh, make sure that one protects one's ideas uh, and uh, such one then, as I said, does have the space within which to develop them. Uh, and you yourself should be the person who is best able to tell uh, whether you've uh, made a discovery which should be protected. Your university um, technology transfer office uh, isn't the expert in the area in which you're working. Um, you are. So it is then up to you to really push your case uh, with uh, your institution that you think you have uh, come up with something which uh, the um, the institution should invest sufficient funds in to protect uh, the intellectual property of. So in summary, do good science, uh, but then be a good salesman uh, for your science and the potential of your science to those who are going to actually have to put their hands in their pockets uh, and pay to protect it. Right. And maybe on that note, I mean, you talked a lot about how, um, you know, the company had some like near death experiences trying to really make it to the end and, you know, the stamina that's needed, I guess, to kind of transition out of academia um, and not really having your, you know, foot dipped in academia because investors didn't really like that. So did you ever waver at all about making that final transition? Because I think a lot of people, you know, are always holding on to academia and there's really that hesitancy to make that jump to industry and fully remove yourself from academia. I, I do think it's important to jump in with both feet and not sort of uh, do it as a, as a sort of hobby uh, or anything of, of that nature. Uh, unless you fully immerse yourself in it, uh, you're, you're insufficiently motivated and driven uh, to actually make it happen. And what you're going to end up ha having uh, is that it will become sort of be taken out of your hands uh, as uh, professionals uh, come in or are brought in uh, to take the program uh, forward. Uh, and without jumping in with both feet, uh, it's it's not really possible to, to remain um, fully connected with it uh, in the longer term. It may be feasible for the first couple of years, but at some point you're going to have to make the decision to go fully into the company and give up academia uh, or go back to academia. There isn't really a, a halfway house, which I've seen successfully uh, accomplished. And it right. is a different discipline working in a company to working in academia. Uh, as I said, it's extraordinarily important not to get diverted down uh, interesting avenues, but which are not on your critical path for developing products. Uh, whereas in academia, obviously, uh, that, that's really what one aims to do is, is identify new areas uh, to explore, to push back the boundaries. But unless it's really leading to products which can actually make money, which is what investors are interested in, uh, then one shouldn't be doing it. Right. And maybe just speaking, you know, to jumping into things, maybe Carolina, you could talk a little bit about, you know, taking that kind of like leap of faith. So same idea as transitioning out of academia and jumping into industry. But when you made the decision to kind of leave your country and your friends and family and every comfort you had and, you know, really jump to move to Canada, um, do you do you think that it was because of more opportunity here or what really drove, drove that decision for you? Um, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I think it was um, because of the lack of opportunities in, in, in my, my uh, country. So 
reality is when, when you want to do something uh, as uh, Dr. Coffin mentioned, you need to in immerse yourself. Doesn't matter uh, where it is. And, and in my case, I really want to do science and I, and I did not see a path in, in Argentina. So I, I decided to explore other opportunities where um, science is at a different level. I'm not saying that, that in, in third world countries, they don't do science, but, but the priorities are very different. So in my case was, was mostly, I, I wanted to do science at the level that I'm currently doing. And, and, and I have a vision that science can be translated. Um, which is something that I did not um, have the opportunity to do back home. So I think mostly it was lack of opportunities um, that why I'm here and why I'm still here. And in addition to now loving where I am and, and working with great people, but yes. And Sometimes do you think that, uh... oh, sorry, if the opportunities are not there, you need to, go for it and, and try to find them bottom line yeah right and you had a really clear driven um idea of what you wanted to do uh, but you did decide to switch disciplines so do you think that that shift in your discipline helped to make you a more comprehensive scientist or did you find it challenging to make that shift um of course it was challenging every time that we start something new it is challenging and I always say if I'm not being challenged it's because I'm not pushing myself enough so yes it was challenging but I think it was also rewarding um, and and I think is I'm happy that I changed disciplines and but I say change disciplines is not that I start something from scratch I think once you have the basic skills and, and, and the tools that maybe your PhD could offer. And you can use those tools and your, those skills to do many different things. One could be studying something different. The other is exploring other career path. And, and, and uh, you can, there is a lot of people that will do a PhD and then for example, decided to go to patenting law or going to, um, communications or, or maybe so we could use the skills that we develop during so the PhD is not only knowledge is skills and those skills can be put to use in many other ways and many different aspects of science right science is not only doing experiments is has all these different aspects that um, we as well-trained people could, could explore um, so no, I don't regret it. I think it was great. I think in push me in and also a, coming to a field with different perspectives and with different tools and resources, um, you can be more creative sometimes. So it, it is okay. I, I think it, right. it was a good move. Yeah. So maybe along that same line, Sam, you also you know had like of that background to start and then got more into immunology, you've worked with many different in vivo models. So also in your own career trajectory, do you think that it helped bring you to where you are today and makes your lab a bit more maybe comprehensive and diverse than if you had taken what people would have deemed a more straight career path? Thank you, Alisa. Uh, I, I, I share uh, most of the opinion of uh, Carolina because I, I think it's it's a an opportunity and uh, at the same time a challenge for me going from like a fish immunology to cancer was like a big kind of leap but it, it provided me access to more resource like so for example if we see it in the context of my lab now we could apply to virology panel like grant grants to virology panel we can go to cancer panels and the, the students I get, some of them are interested in, in virology, the others are interested in cancer. So you actually have more uh, uh, more questions to handle. And it, it's also a, a cross a fertilization of ideas, like the, the cancer people can feed uh, bright ideas to the virus people. And they, so it, it comes to be very interesting. It, it's sometimes difficult to manage 
the specific projects, but that's when you can actually, you know, hire also senior postdocs who can handle the areas. But I, I think it has its own challenge and also it provides you opportunity to access uh, more resource. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I think obviously one of the biggest challenges for postdocs usually is carving out their own independent niche. So Sam, do you think that having that diverse background help you to more develop your own specific niche working under Karen so that you had something independently to take away as, a, as an independent professor? Uh, yes, definitely. So when I joined the lab, the research I was, I was doing wasn't there. Like, so uh, I started like, getting really interested in, into immunogenic cells. There was like a couple of publications uh, and then like, you know, coming from the virus idea, uh, uh, the virus perspective, and then having to know the immunology in McMaster, I, I kind of wanted to go into something that's not studied that much, which is program cell day. So it, it, it helped me a lot uh, to, to find my, my own uh, research. And that, that's very difficult, right? Like when you are early career faculty, if you don't have like your own uh, niche, it could uh, it could create difficulty uh, it, for you to get like your independent money and resource, yeah. Right. And maybe just coming back to Robert, I know Robert, you mentioned uh, the difficulty of that delicate family and career balance and kind of, you know, you've had a really successful and driven career. So would you have any advice to younger trainees about you know, how they can balance that family and career when they, they are ambitious and they wanna have a very successful career either in academia or industry? Well, I'm not necessarily sure I'm the best person to give advice on that because I don't think I, I really quite achieved it. Um, certainly for, for many years, I, I, I wasn't uh, really achieving it, but I was lucky enough in the latter parts of, of, of that um, for quite a number of years to have a very supportive partner who was uh, uh, fully behind uh, what, was, what, what, what we were trying to do uh, and really herself put her own um, personal um, you know, ambitions on hold, including having children a little bit later than we would otherwise ha have done. So uh, I think um, it's obviously lonely uh, going it entirely alone. So uh, hopefully <laughs> accomplishing a personal life uh, where you both have a similar vision uh, and uh, and um, shared ambition uh, to to. Um, to put things on hold for a, a period which is necessary but you know pe yeah so I, I don't think i'm necessarily the best person to answer the question but That's i did my okay, best yes. but... <laughs> so, so being careful who your partner is good, yeah, good partner yeah, selection. Exactly. Yeah, um, yeah. so there's actually a question in the chat from nicholas chang so asking uh what are your opinions on transitioning to industry right after a phd versus doing one to two postdocs and then transitioning to industry are there advantages in terms of future opportunities from doing a postdoc first before the transition? I hope I'm better able to answer that question. Right, um, exactly. so, um, so I think if I think if one wants to do basic science and one's real interest is in real basic science, putting pushing back the boundaries in a way which you don't really know where it may be going, really exploring new ground, uh, then um, the biotech industry is not the place to be. Uh, biotech is somewhere, uh, and the pharmaceutical industry, is where uh, the basic science should have already been done. Uh, and what you're doing in the companies is applying that science to uh, take it forward to actually uh, make products which can help people, uh, but also uh, make money. If you want to do basic science, one unfortunately does probably uh, need to remain in active academia uh, to really have the freedom to explore and follow the data wherever it may go without any clear necessary necessarily uh, ultimate objective from a, a making money perspective, which is what businesses are all about. Um, 
However, I do think that it is best to before one goes into uh, industry, if one does believe that one is ready to move out of the basic science realm into the directed research realm, uh, to have got enough experience under one's belt, such you are a properly seasoned scientist uh, and can uh, command uh, the respect uh, of um, those in industry who will then be your peers and ideally be able to move into industry, not on the very bottom rung, but uh, already uh, with a relatively established career so that you can move into industry uh, at, uh, at a higher level. So I think there is considerable benefit in reality in, in establishing an actual academic career um, beyond the, even the postdoc level uh, before um, jumping into industry, which will uh, put you many uh, rungs up the corporate ladder uh, if if one does. Right. So, I mean, in the U.S., I know they have a lot of um, actually stratified postdocs where it's, you know, you actually declare if you're going to be an academic postdoc, in mm -hmm. which case maybe it's a five to six year postdoc or an industry postdoc, maybe only one to two years. So if I'm gathering what you say correctly, then, you know, even though we don't have that actually stratified system in Canada, and I'm not sure about the UK, but um, having, you know, that predetermined idea of what you want. So maybe you look at your postdoc less as six years to get a nature paper about a small mechanistic link and more about gaining that experience as more of an independent scientist. Would that be correct? Yes, although there's obviously no real playbook or, or formula, uh, which is just going to work if you apply it, everybody needs to take the opportunities which, which are presented to them or which they make for themselves and at each fork in the road where you could go one way or the other, um, make, make the best decision one can on the basis of all information. There really is no, no formula. Um, I, I, I don't think anybody has had exactly the same route as, as I've had. And likewise, neither of the other two speakers, uh, others would generally have not had uh, exactly the same route. So I, I really don't think there's a formula. One does need to take the best opportunity one can at every point where there's a, a decision point uh, and make one's own opportunity too. Right. I think that's such a good point about having more flexibility, whereas we typically think of scientific careers as kind of like a straight path. And none of you have had careers that have been like a straight path. You've all had very interesting journeys. So I think that's a nice point. Uh, maybe so coming back to some... Oh, sorry. So I was going to say, as interviewers often have a sort of a sort of question is, where do you think you'll be in five years time? Or where would you want to be in five yes. years time? At any point for me, the answer is I've got no idea. Uh, it, 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 it's always been, it's, it, we'll see what comes up and I'll take the best decisions on the basis of, uh, of, of, of what's, what, 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 what I could do. So. Right. Um, so Sam and Carolina, you both had touched on um, really the importance of choosing your mentors carefully. And it's something that I felt strongly in grad school as well. And I felt very fortunate to work with Karen for my PhD. And I actually was very selective when I chose her. Um, so could you maybe speak to, you know, how do young trainees pick a mentor? And like, is there, should there be a more of an open dialogue that trainees not only get interviewed by potential PIs, but should trainees also be interviewing those PIs and asking them questions? And if so, what should they be asking and looking for? Okay. So I think that is a very great idea. And, and indeed, when I, for example, when I interview potential students and, and I always said to them, okay, so we will, this is a chat and, and, and I agree with you, it has to be both ways. And I think for the part, so mentor and mentee indeed is a partnership, right? Like, and, and that partnership, I, I agree with you that both parties had to be, comfortable with that partnership. And sometimes work, sometimes doesn't work, but I think to, to cover your bases is, is true. It, trainees should also interview um, the future supervisor. But what I encourage the people that interview my group at least is to set up meetings with all my trainees and, and at least with group of friends. And, and before it used to be I will invite them to the lab and maybe have coffee with my people. Now it's all virtual, but, but I think it's extremely important that the trainees also not only interview the, the future supervisor, but also get a sense of the team dynamics that is 
uh, is in place in, in that particular uh, laboratory or, or, or research group. And, and contacting the, the other people in the lab and, and, and ask the questions is, how is this person as a, as a mentor? You know, like we all need different mentorship styles and, and, and we need support in many different ways. So people had to really think what will potentiate my, my, myself, right? Like what make, will make me better? And some people will say a mentor that is every day on top of what I'm doing. Others will say, I'd like to be independent. So I think it's extremely important to know what, what will bring the best of yourself. And, and ask those questions to, of course, your mentor, but also the other people in the lab. I think um, we spend so much time um, in, in, with, with the people that we work with that it's extremely important to, to get a sense if you, that is the right fit for you. Um, so that will be my advice, not only interview your mentor, but also your future colleagues and get a sense if that is the right environment that uh, you will be, you know, it will foster the best of you. Right. Yeah, that's a great point. Because I mean, obviously, a PhD is not a short amount of time. So no, yeah. you will be there for a long time. So I think that's a really good piece of advice. Um, so we only have a few minutes left. So maybe if we could just wrap up with maybe if each of you want to give us like your if you had to really boil it down to like one sentence or one piece of advice for young trainees who maybe don't know exactly what they want their career to look like and are just kind of navigating through it. Uh, what advice would you give to them? Maybe Robert, if you want to start. Um, okay, um, very briefly, I, I think it's extremely important to always say sort of true to yourself, uh, not sell out at some point along the way or take the sort of easy option, which is really not what your heart is telling you. Uh, I, I do think your head is important, but you need to absolutely follow your heart to maintain the uh, enthusiasm uh, and inquisitiveness, which is what made us all scientists in the, in, in the first place. So don't sell out, stay too true to yourself. Uh, one is going to need um, stamina uh, in whatever scientific career one has, either academically or 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 in or in a company or or, or elsewhere. Uh, but while one does need that stamina and stubbornness and uh, and drive, I think it's also extremely important to to not not. Not, to not take it too seriously you have to do it seriously but we also need to be able to rise above it and not actually take it too seriously so you can actually maintain your sanity uh, while you're actually actually doing it so those would be my two or three pieces of advice yeah that's a really really great point and something you don't hear people actually give as advice often so thank you for that and maybe carolina next yeah sure so i think i will summarize it in be perseverance be flexible and uh, prepare yourself to to accept what you have but also change change is always good um, and also don't compare with i mean be yourself don't compare with others each career journey is different there is many different ways to accomplish success so just be yourself and, and be passionate about what you do that's really great advice, especially the flexibility point. I think we're often like pigeonholed into, you know, I need to postdoc and I need this paper and I need this. So that's a really good point. And Sam? Yeah, my advice is when things are difficult, results are not coming up like, you know, the way you want it. Always look forward and see your realistic dreams. And when they happen, you will be having a joyful moment. So look, look forward is my advice. Good, and maybe like reasonable short-term goals so you can, you know, have those small wins as well. They're just as important. Um, so I am going to uh, pass it over to Laszlo for our final statements and conclusions. And I'll just thank you from myself to all of the speakers and for such a great discussion. Thank you, Elisa. That was a really interesting session and really, um, very deep insights into building a career in science and some of the decision-making points and the work-life balance um, and industry versus academia. I think the message that I always give too as well is don't be afraid to change. Change is good. Um, it's a big world out there and biology is a continuum. Um, you know, we're 
the pathways that you study in plants are, are similar. The processes are the same. The conceptualizations are the same in, in mammals or plants. Uh, I, I, I was actually very interested to hear that Rob started his career in plant biology. I started my career in plant biology, by the way, too, as well. People are surprised to hear that. And then I, and I went into, um, you know, um, medical research and, and immunology. I kind of just, just happened to just haphazardly fall into it. <laughs> and so it's, it, I guess it's a lesson to be passionate and, and to not be afraid of change. And there's no, set career path or recipe um you you have to follow your heart as and and be passionate as, as carolina says so i'd like to thank the panelists again elisa excellent facilitation uh thanks for joining the event um our next event is targeted for february 2022 for the people that are uh, participating today please get the word out to your colleagues in your labs in your research groups in your networks um, at their universities and research institutes about OICR Rising Stars. Here is the website. There's the OICR website. That's the Rising Stars email. Go to the OICR website, take a look at it again, and please advertise the Rising Stars because I think the more trainees we get involved in this, the better. And, and it, because it's a really powerful network that has really empowered a lot of our trainees. And we're always looking for new ideas on how to improve the network, um, new activities, new modes of communication, new ways of empowering our, our future scientists in cancer. Because, you know, I want to see Ontario be the hotbed of the training and the fostering of the best future cancer researchers in the world. So, and OICR is committed to do that. So, um, with that, I, I would uh, I'll close the session. I look forward to seeing uh, the people who are here and additional people uh, for our next um, iteration of Rising Stars and our next exciting um, uh, OICR JLab Symposium that will be held uh, immediately before that. So have a nice rest of the day and, um, and good luck with everybody's career. Bye-bye. <laughs>